I am Dr. Carey. I am a pediatrician in Ventura, California, and we are Talking Baby Care. Today, I'd like to introduce Mark Wormuth. Mark is a certified orthotist with Channel Island Prosthetics Orthotics, and he is here to discuss positional plagiocephaly, or in simple terms, babies who are born with misshapen heads. Welcome. Yes. Boy, they need another term other than positional plagiocephaly. It can yeah. scare the bejeebers out of anyone, I think. Yes, it can. Okay. It can, yes. Uh, but before we talk about that and what, it, what that is, uh, please tell me about uh, what is an orthotist? What, how does one get certified yeah. to be an orthotist? An orthotist actually is one that's trained uh, post-bachelorate. There's a prosthetics orthotic program, so I went through a prosthetic orthotic program. And we're trained in all aspects of orthopedic bracing, from cervical bracing, spinal bracing, uh, fracture bracing, um, any kind that we deal with stroke patients, head injury, for leg braces, sport injuries, uh, knee braces for ACL type injuries for athletes. And so it's any type of orthopedic bracing. Um, this is just one of the types of devices that we've been using to help these infants that have these deformed heads. Sounds like you have a brace for every part of the body. <laughs> yes, we, we do. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, as far as positional plagiocephaly, we're talking about little babies who, when they're born, their head just seems to be misshapen for one reason or another. And mm -hmm. well, there are, are reasons in terms of the way the skull is forming. We have different sutures mm -hmm. among all the plates of the bones that mm -hmm. may not have formed correctly and may be attached mm -hmm. inappropriately. For this discussion, we're mm -hmm. talking about those who seem to just be smushed in a way. Yes, there's deformational forces uh, that could have occurred uh, interuterine that where the deformation could have occurred. Uh, it can happen with multiple births. There's not a lot of space in there. The head's being pressed, could be in a breech position. Um, deformation can occur uh, intrapartum and it occurs postpartum as well. There's just deformational forces that are occurring. Um, I can show you a sample here of Absolutely. what that looks like. Remove the helmet, so uh -huh. the cranial remolded. And here is kind of an, a sample of a head that shows that flattening that can occur. And this is on the left side. And basically, we're seeing the, that this half of the head is shifted forward relative to the right side. So we have a broader area here. And parents will see it. They'll probably bring it to your attention. Often when they're giving them a bath, the, the head is wet, the hair lays down. They go, my gosh, something isn't quite right. You know, and they'll bring it to your attention. When, when parents do bring this to my attention, I tend to focus a little less, personally in my office, mm -hmm. I tend to focus a little less on the flattening of the back of the head, but I take a look at the baby from top down to see where the ears are in mm -hmm. relation to one another, and I like yes. them to be on the same plane. Absolutely. To, to what extent is that a reasonable way of helping to assess whether this is an issue or not? That's an excellent approach. Um, in our office, we have, we'll, we'll see the patient and we'll take anthrop anthropomorphic metric measurements. There's a so big word. We'll, yeah, what does another that mean? one. We'll take measurements of the head, circumferences. We'll take measurements across the head, anterior to posterior, side to side, and diagonal measurements. And these diagonal measurements will show us the difference in the head shape and gives us data to go by. So we have data that we can say, on this date, this is how much difference there is in this head shape. Uh, we, could, we provide that to the pediatricians. They can use that data as a baseline to evaluate in the future if they want to proceed with a cranial remolding helmet or orthosis. Or if there's a change, is the head getting better? Is the head getting worse? They'll have a baseline to say, on this date, here's where we were. Uh, <clears throat> before we talk about treatment, what to do about mm -hmm. it, and what, mm -hmm. whether we see a grand outcome with treatment. Uh, we talked about different ways in which this occurs. One of the controversies has been how much our back to sleep program to reduce, reduce the incidence mm -hmm. of sudden infant death syndrome has mm -hmm. actually led to uh, an increased amount of children, mm -hmm. newborns, having a quote unquote misshapen head. Have you seen a grand shift in the number of children because of putting them to sleep on their back? Or, mm -hmm. and, and if you have, 
do you feel that that in itself has been a significant enough reason to recommend doing something about it? Uh, it definitely. Since 92, around 1992, when the uh, so pediatricians began the back to sleep program, the data has shown a dramatic increase in uh, positional plagiocephaly. However, the advantages of the back to sleep program far outweigh this issue. This is non-invasive, simple compared to the SIDS problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so, really key to, to yes. mention that this has been a wonderful program yes. to, to help reduce the incidence of a really uh, scary uh, mm -hmm. event that can mm -hmm. be fatal to mm -hmm. a newborn. Uh, but I was also curious about to what extent has our awareness of it altered the statistics versus the incidence itself? Because I'm, I'm not sure whether it was talked about as much in the uh, 80s and 70s. It, it wasn't. There were incidents of it, but just wasn't as dramatic. It wasn't on the radar screen, but it, it has become more dramatic since uh, the Back to Sleep program. Plus, just societally, <clears throat> we have our children in car seats, which have a hard back surface behind them. We have them in strollers with their head on a back, hard back surface. And so that also, I believe, is a contributing factor to this as well. So we really have a lot of things going on and it's really hard to pinpoint it to one, mm. one yes. cause. Right. What age is it important to, I imagine that there comes a point where the helmet just isn't as effective anymore. I try in my office to catch it very early, mm -hmm. right at two and four months of age, I'm taking a look at their heads and, yes. and I really like to get them for helmet placements mm -hmm. at, by four months of age, but I imagine that there are times when it doesn't happen that soon. Absolutely. Um, our goal and our treatment parameters are from three months to 18 months. Those are the months in which the head is growing. It's that growth within the helmet that gives us that corrective um, capability. Um, ideal is four to eight months. Um, we do not treat infants be before three months. Um, at that age, they do repositioning. Um, in the in pediatrician's guidance, they want to gui uh, set the baby back onto this higher point of the skull, right. change the pressure parameters. Um, so we are, I ideally, we'd like to start at four months. That way we get maximum growth. That brain is growing, expanding into the skull. It's expanding the skull and we can contain it with mild pressures and help reshape and remold that skull into an, a symmetrical uh, shape. The, uh, it seems at 18 months, mm -hmm. I wonder how, how effective you are in really making a grand change here. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, we have a lot of our head growth by two years of age. Yes. There's a little bit of molding that can go on to the third decade of life, my understanding mm -hmm. is. I mean, it can really mm -hmm. go on for mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. But there comes a point where all those bones start to fix a little bit more. Yes. For children who this is not addressed after 12 months, do you really see a, a grand change or are you just trying to minimize mm -hmm. things? We do see a change. Uh, we do not see a lot into the 12 month range. We've had some at 14, 16, and mm -hmm. a lot of it has to do with the development of the child. Um, we did have one child, actually at two years, the father wanted to go and get a helmet. But it was a very petite, small child, so I, th I don't think his growth development. Mm -hmm. So we were successful at, at that age group actually seeing improvement. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of it has to do with the development of that specific child. Um, to, so. Now, I like to have them treated not because there's anything that's going to affect brain development. So these, right. Even if a child doesn't have a helmet placed on them, even if we don't straighten the head, they're still going to develop fine, they're still mm -hmm. going to do all the things they're supposed to do. It's not going to affect intelligence in any way. It's purely cosmetic. Um, that's a good point. This, the brain, it's not impacting the brain's development and functionality. There are concerns about the deformation that's occurring with the skull, that it can impact the mandibular aspect of the face, and so the mandibular, the joint positioning of the jaw, there are concerns about the, the vision, if, the, if it's extreme, the displacement of the face right to left can mm -hmm. impact the visual field um, possibly in the future. So there are concerns of that. There aren't a lot of definitive studies, right. but there are concerns that those things could occur. I also am 
concern because <laughs> right or wrong as a society, we tend to subconsciously judge people by symmetry. Yeah. And we don't necessarily notice it, but when someone has an asymmetric quality, we put mm -hmm. a judgment on that. Yes. And trying to correct that helps with uh, one's self-esteem down the road if mm -hmm. they're not aware that that's what's mm -hmm. leading to the negative effect on them. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I guess that's one of the reasons why I try to make a good point of checking for mm -hmm. symmetry. Mm -hmm. uh, you brought a helmet. Show us how this how it works. What do we do? We take uh, these measurements. We garner these measurements and then we take a, we have some of the latest technology where we scan the child's head and from that data we generate a helmet. Um, it's a molded plastic with a foam liner, um, has a Velcro closure and it's this, we build into the helmet corrective parameters that we want to achieve with the child's head shape. So, and it just comes on and off. The goal, it's easy to clean, maintain. The goal is to have them wear it at 23 hours a day. For how long? And, um, the average data is 4.5 months, but anywhere from between three and six months. And uh, I mean, there's some children will see results within two weeks. They come back for a checkup. My gosh, the parents are happy. The others, it might be a month or so if the child's skull and, and isn't growing, then that corrective action is not How's the cheap. compliance with that for, I mean, that's 23 hours a day. That's a lot to ask for someone. Right. And I believe it's very good. Mm -hmm. um, we've, I believe we've had, for my uh, patients, 100% success when the patients are compliant in the utilization of this. Mm -hmm. those. Okay. Uh, but I imagine you've had some who just don't want to wear this. They right, and, and, and it's, you know, often it's the dad coming in. I don't want my kid to have to wear that. Really? The mother's been there and then the dad comes in and we're just, we just have to reinforce it. It's not going to work if it's not being worn. Fair but, enough. Well, again, I think this is a remarkable technology. I think mm -hmm. it's really nice that we're able to make a change which can have such a uh, long-lasting mm -hmm. uh, positive impact on a person well into mm -hmm. adulthood. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I thank Mark for joining me in discussing this common problem. I am Dr. Carey, and thank you for watching. For more baby care education and to sign up for our free newsletter, please visit us at drcarries.com. And remember, at Dr. Carey's, we teach baby care. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Okay. Let me see your ears.